All right, this is Chris Jarvis and Kat Fobert with the Quiz 3 Project, and we are here with the indomitable Eddie Enos. So down there was also the Metro at one point. The Metro and the Underground. And the Underground, right. And Quacks. There was Quacks, the, I don't know about that one. Quacks you? was a piano bar. Oh, okay. okay. There was the Metro Station, right? and then it had Quacks inside, and then downstairs was the Underground. The underground, right. And we did shows at the Underground. The hottest bar in town. I mean... Temperature-wise, because it was downstairs and there was no air circulation. And you know I what? I, that, place. that was the first bar that allowed after hours, and yeah. the after hours was mixed. Yeah, because people used to go to the other bars and then they'd go to the underground for after hours. And then the West Side people, uh, I knew some of them as clients, so when they were coming down uh, the. To the underground, Virgil went and said, Eddie, there's some people that ask for you. I had no clue who in the hell these people were. And when I saw them, I said, oh, yeah, they're my clients. He goes, okay, are they going to be okay? And I said, yeah. And that was the first introduction of straight to Virgil's underground bar. They got along so well until they started bringing, telling some of their friends. And then there was lines of people trying to get in, and they actually started arguing, heavy arguing, on these, the gay guys looking at some of these straight guys, because these straight guys were fine as hell, and it was a summer, so everybody was in tank tops, t-shirts. But it wasn't really mixed at that time. No. A I mean, um, gay bar was a gay bar. Right, and these people were going again for the music, and it was only club that was after hours. Mm -hmm. So instead of going to house party, oh wow, there was this great club. And again, when you danced, it was like that. You could go in there dry, and if you were on the dance floor, oh, you were going to sweat. You bar, walked out wet, ringing wet. Mm -hmm. And this is what gets me. I walked out of that bar so wet so many times in the dead of winter. Yeah, because the bar closed at four, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And then we kept thinking, well, where do... And then half of us would go to Klein, I mean, uh, Denny's. And when they would see us walking at Denny's, it was like they thought we were crazy mm -hmm. because we were half naked and still buzzing. And uh, we got sober in those two hours, but we were still out of buzz from just dancing and having so much fun. They started having waitresses because this was on Blackstone and Shields. Yeah. Extra people coming in to wait on us, to help serve us. After two o'clock. Yeah, that was the gay Danish. Yeah. That was, I love that. That was so, uh, that then places started establishing, uh, allowing us to go in because there was always money. Right. And then there was a bar that opened up across the street from Rolling Park. Uh, Rose, El Rose and Darlene, El Rose, Darlene, part of the, uh, part of the court went and bought this bar because they wanted to have the court functions there. So at one point you go to San Francisco. When do you first move to San Francisco and then you come back? Okay, um, after we did the pageants uh, and I gave my crown away, we were doing shows, we were doing bar shows. There wasn't a foundation, there was a bunch of us. Uh, Jerry Dayton, uh, Russ, Jesse, myself, Barry Connors, Ronnie Gonzalez, Ronnie Gonzalez was the opera singer that mm -hmm. I liked him, but he just worked my last day. Anyway, it was all, all of these people that would meet at Joe Ashcroft's house. And Joe Ashcroft talked about getting um, a group that would, would travel to the bars. Not travel, but do shows in different bars. We would do the same show, but a different bar. So he was the first one that really got, was like a leader and had... Uh, organization. Then it was um, Bob Benson had it for the show. But Bob Benson's bar sort of died out. They started having too many people come in from the West Side because they liked the bar being that far out. They could drink in the parking lot. Uh, the only trouble they had with, with the lesbians in the beginning, what they called bull dykes, mm -hmm. that would literally pull knives out. And it's the first time I'd ever seen anything like that. And uh, it was the first and last time, because that was sort of what got me out of going uh, to just the Girl of the Golden West. After I got my little badge, I wanted to hit as many bars as I could, but there wasn't that. There was only Franz, the little gas station bar, which it was only, it wasn't a bar. I mean, it was a, a juice bar. That was the first time I'd ever heard of a juice bar, because they had 
those little cans of juice and uh, 7-Up, everything was in a bottle or a little can with straws. They had no glasses. They had paper cups, paper glasses. It stayed open for like maybe five, six months, mm. maybe a year at the most. But it was like they had the best music. We Nobody danced. Everybody hung out and talked. It was like, like what we're doing now. A group would just talk and then somebody would be sitting on the side and introduce themselves. So that's how you talked around the tables. Right. And then if you went outside to cruise, that's when you met everybody else. <laughs> and Chuck Gray was always in his big old car. He would always um, pose. He would pose. Good look, a beautiful guy. And the beautiful, most beautiful personality. After the shows, uh, Joe Ashcroft had him started. Jerry Dayton could add to that because Jerry Dayton was part of that group. And then Jesse was part of that group too because Jesse and Joe were close. And then Joe Ashcroft's lover was Little Jess. They were all interested in show business because they wanted to... Joe Ashcroft was big and he always wanted to do drag and everybody kept saying no because you're too big. It wasn't that he was big, he was just um, too handsome. Everybody said, you make a good guy, don't mess it up by going and drag. <laughs> okay. You know, it's like, don't do it, please. That was before Closet Ball or any of that came out. So uh, that started and then all of a sudden the pageant, it was like 73, 74, 75, I forget what year that uh, they went and said, okay, we're going to have this pageant at the Hacienda. And the Hacienda opened, uh, opened themselves to us. That's where I met Sharon uh, Blockley, one of my clients. For Well, that was the first day I had her. Uh, I did her, and she said, come to my house, do you do hair? And I said, yes. I said, I'm still in beauty college. Oh, and I was working for Josephson. Anyway, we and went... the Hacienda was a resort, right? Or a hotel? A resort. A resort. It had, and that's where I saw The Temptations, The Pointer Sisters, Nancy Wilson, uh, incredible entertainers. Eartha Kitt, was she there? Yeah, Eartha Kitt, uh, Robert Peterson. Peter I think Roberts. Him too. Yeah. <laughs> I met, I mean, met her backstage, and that's when those two connected, because they're good, good friends, yeah. or they were, uh, and then um, there was the Mermaid Room, there was a Crazy Horse, and then there was a Las Vegas Room. So we got the Las Vegas Room, and once, once the pageant went on, and the coronation, I thought that's all it was. So there was a, 11 of us, we went through that, it was um, daytime, they only had one outfit to show, and then we had a question to ask. Asked, we didn't have any enter entertainment. Charles Pierce was our entertainment. Oh, wow. Uh, and Charles Pierce, and then Missy, uh, Miss Faria, Mike Faria from San Fran Los Angeles. He was, he was originally from Fresno, and he used to, we used to call him Fanny Flag. That was his drag name, or Miss Faria. So then when he moved to L.A., he was in part, he got involved with the coordination. So then he introduced the coordination system to Fresno. That's how Jesse first was introduced to it. Well, we were all introduced to it. And then for the pageant went on and uh, they named, uh, they had an empress, princess one, duchess and a countess. That was a year that I moved to San Francisco. So I wasn't really part of it. I was, um, I was living in San Francisco when they, went to the San Francisco Coronation and asked me to represent Fresno. So that was, I was Princess One there. And then after that, I never, I was gone three years. So those are three years that the court developed. The court went through the um, stages of forming itself. So when did you, so, so you did the first sort of what would be, what the pre, the kind of first starting of the, that first pageant. Yes, at the Hacienda, that was the first pageant. We didn't know what it was other mm -hmm. than um, a Miss Fresno. To me, well, all of us, uh, all, all of the nine or eleven, went and said, "Okay, this is um, a Fres Miss Fresno pageant." Right, and similar to the other pageants you did. Right, and uh, the uh, other pageants, we had to entertain. We had to do a number, and then we had to answer questions, uh, and that was all. Uh, and then it got to where we had to have daytime, 
uh, an evening. That's when Cher won Fresno, and we got she won. So we uh, she went to Los Angeles, and she won there. Yeah. And that was I loved that because I went with her to do her hair. It was that was one of the most beautiful experiences her and I ever had together, because the ones that ran were Asian. They were everybody was Asian. And there was just Cher and then a white girl, a white guy, and the rest were Asians. And these Asians, they are so beautiful that they look real. They just overacted. They, oh, it was too, they were too dramatic. Even the ones that were so convincing, it's like, be real. Don't, don't be a drag queen. You know, this is a pageant. Try to be real. Cher walked up, beautiful smile, very uh, well posed, well walked. I mean, performed beautifully. Where the other ones, they had a lot of attitude. I think the models then gave out attitudes. And everyone, it was so sad because they were ugly with attitude. But the minute they smiled, then they were beautiful. And it was like, you know, share one hands down because she was just spot, I mean, perfect. And I lent her this hat that was so big. It was a sun uh, a hat that I got on the beach. And it was for sunbathing. So we just sprayed it and tilted it. She walked out and the hat was as wide as she was tall. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so when did you come back to Fresno? I came back 4th of July. They had a going away party for me. And I had all of these gifts. I didn't want to stay at the party. I wanted to go home. I wanted to move to Fresno. My car was loaded. Uh, the trunk, they opened up the trunk, stuck all my birthday presents, all of that in. I got busted and stopped in Las Banas at seven felonies and six misdemeanors. For what? All the shit they found, the paraphernalia that they found oh, in my car. No. When I moved back, I got involved with the court, but I had a year. The judge, thank God, since nothing was opened, erased everything. Wow. Uh, and it went on my record for three years, and then it was dropped as long as I finished a program with Russell Bader. And Russell Bader was a psychologist. Uh, he's here in, here in Fresno. And I met him on a plane two months before I needed him. And uh, they appointed me to him, and I had no clue that they were going to appoint him to me. So what I did, I had, he said, Eddie, he goes, I need you because I'm starting a gay group. So I loved it because I sat in with him for three years, helping these people that had children that were gay understand their children. And it was, it was so real because I could use my own experience and I, uh, everything that happened to me, I was able to share with them. And then we found out a couple of husbands were gay and they blamed themselves for their child, their children being gay. And then I got involved. I didn't get involved with the court those three years. I didn't get involved with the court because I wasn't allowed to um, really go to clubs or be um, or to really drink. Uh, so it wasn't a DUI that they got me for, but it was possession of all of these. Mm. And I told them I had moved out of San Francisco because I wanted to get out of the uh, the drug scene there. My People that I worked with were doing coke. The people I lived with were smoking marijuana. The people I was going out with were doing uh, reds, second all, sleeping pills. And it was, uh, I was getting too confused. It was like, I was trying to still please people. I found myself doing everything and sort of losing it. Mm -hmm. So I thought, no, I need to, for me to keep my sanity, I need to move back to Fresno. Okay. So when I, that was the reason I moved back to Fresno. And those three years, uh, when I got involved, it was at Jerry Dayton's house. That's when I got back involved in the court. <laughs>